Would you lead us in prayer? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love and your mercy. And Father, we begin to hear the day, we pray that you'll open our mouths to your word, that you'll continue your word, and we'll put your word into action in our lives. So we glorify you in all that we do. We call on us and want to seek refuge in you. Father, help us be attentive to the message this morning and, and see how it applies to us and see if we can teach it to others. Amen. Okay, so we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. So far we've covered verses 1 through 7, and we're going to cruise a bit today. So I'll start reading with verse 8. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in regard to the things that have been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. That's an interesting passage for a couple of reasons. For starters, the audience. The audience is to all of those different locations we saw that first week up there in Asia Minor, well, Turkey now, and it was Roman provinces. The people that were there, I didn't, I put it in a D there, provinces, <laughs> the people that were there were there because they had probably been initially at Pentecost. And because they had been witness to what took place then and believed, they carried that forward. And when they finally got back home, they continued in it. It grew and Peter is writing to them. Those people would have been, as we talked about back then, Hellenistic Jews. Jews who grew up outside of Judea, outside of Israel, grew up in the customs of a Gentile world, grew up with the language being a non, well, it wasn't Hebrew, wasn't Aramaic as the dominant language, it would have been Greek as far as inside the Roman Empire, grew up in a different culture. But those are the people that went out, the dispersion that he referred to in the first couple of verses. It's 30 years later. We talked about, I believe, how it was 40 years recently, anniversary of this congregation's existence. Yet, how many are here today that were here 40 years ago? Congregation doesn't look anything like what it looked like 40 years ago based on what Robert said in that one post on Facebook. Radically different. I know I wasn't here 40 years ago. So, the same is true here. The people that are being, or that are receiving this letter aren't the same people from 30 years ago. I mean, hopefully, yes, those people remain faithful, but there are going to be a lot of other people. And where are we? We're inside of Roman provinces. Is the congregations that are, or are the congregations that are receiving these letters going to be made up of Hellenistic Jews? Most likely not. It's going to be people from that location, that culture. And they're not going to be the ones who have a single clue about what I just read. Because they don't know the prophets well. And you might be thinking, well, okay, Rich, so why is he writing them all that to begin with? For the same kind of reason we're doing what we're doing right now. Can you picture when this letter came in and was read for the first time in a congregation where only one or two, maybe three people in the entire congregation even had met Peter? 
and maybe a dozen of 30 might have a Jewish background. The rest of them are going to hear and go, what prophecies? The rest are going to talk about, well, what kind of faith is he referring to? Because obviously it's something different than what I understand right now. Peter was, in a sense, creating a teachable moment through the letter that he sent that would have two phenomenal benefits. The first benefit was the Jews that were going to have to step it up and explain to those that didn't have that kind of background, what are all these things? I mean, I have an idea of these words, but he seems to imply a whole lot more here. What's going on? Oh, and then they start giving the background. They start communicating the understanding that they grew up in. Where the Old Testament is our tutor leading us to Christ? Okay, time to get out the tutor and start applying and communicating that knowledge. So for those that didn't have the Jewish background, this was going to be an opportunity to grow in their faith a lot. Because now they're learning, oh wow, you mean before the world? Yeah, before the world. Before the world, God, not just God, but God's plan, God's word, Jesus, already existed. God's plan for our salvation existed before the foundation of the world, was accomplished at Calvary, and is now revealed to us. But that revealing is about something that was beginning because God was the one that was beginning it, it was established essentially even before the foundation of this world. And its connection is into eternity. And this is the way you can know that. And how they would teach them the answer to what Peter was writing was to go back to what they already knew. Just like we read it came from the prophets, the understanding of this salvation that the prophets themselves didn't understand was written before Christ came and died at Calvary. So for the Gentiles, this was one of those, whoa, and they're receiving so much information, so much information, but at the same time, it was information that was reassuring them that in spite of all that I'm facing right now, something was written thousands of years ago saying this was coming. Not only that this was coming, the people like me would be a part of it, predestined, predetermined. I am so in that camp. I am one of the ones who can receive this salvation. Then you got the person who's teaching it. And as we all know, the teacher learns as much, if not more, than the student. Because they're the ones, okay, now i got to dig up all that I know from the Old Testament that relates to Christ. And they've got to re-examine the Old Testament in light of the fulfillment. And unfortunately, that's the mistake we make too often today. We treat the Old Testament like it's the old, the new is the new, and they're separate and apart. And a lot of times people even almost treat God like, well, there was the Old Testament version of God when he was sort of ornery and killed people. And then there's the New Testament version. No, they're the same thing. The Old Testament was teaching towards Christ. If we look at the Old Testament without that understanding, we get a lot of stories, a lot of do's and don'ts. And we completely miss out on what the message really was. Unfortunately, that's why David stands out so much. A man after God's own heart. And we know it wasn't because he got the do's and don'ts right. He blew those big time in scary ways. He was a man after God's own heart. Because through the Old Testament that he had, he understood it's about seeking after God. It's not about 
do and don't. It's about striving to be the person pleasing to God. And so for them, in one respect, it was an opportunity to go back, re-examine a religion they had grown up in and potentially not even understood. And that got said there about the prophets themselves. Let's look at that again. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was, your, was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance of the sufferings destined for Christ and subsequent glory. Okay. What's the word? The word is Christ. In the beginning was the word, the word was, was with God, the word was God. We know that's referring to Jesus. And right here, um, inquiring about the person or time that the spirit of Christ within them indicated. They had God's word. It was the law as far as they understood it. God's word. What's God's word? Christ. What is the law? In a sense, it was Christ without the fullness of understanding. It's sort of like if you only look at me from my shoulders on up. Who are you looking at? Rich Kelly. Are you seeing all of Rich Kelly? No, you're seeing me from the shoulders on up. The fact that there's more to me doesn't change that everything you see from here up is accurate. They saw the law. They saw from here up. They saw guidance, they saw direction, and unfortunately they took it wrong, but what they saw was Christ. Because Christ gets baptized. Why does Christ get baptized? Is it for forgiveness of sins? No, because he had no sin. He got baptized to show obedience and submission and to give that example to all of his followers and that was crucial because they needed to understand that as big and as awesome as Jesus was there's a distinction he is not the father even Jesus says I don't know the time that is the father's to know not mine he showed submission, he showed honor, he showed respect. And because of that example, we're to follow that. And, as we also just read, those who wrote about it, those who had that portion of the word working in and through them, didn't really have the full understanding of anything down below the shoulders. Even when they were prophesying about Christ himself. They could say it. They could write about it. But it's like Star Trek. I don't know if y'all watch the Star Trek movies. We're old enough that that might be all of us in here. When Spock dies and comes back to life. Bones asks him, so what was it like? I mean, I had your soul, your spirit, whatever inside my brain for the past couple of months or so, and now it's back in you and I'm glad to have you back. So what was it like? And Spock's response is, we have no context for communication here. Where Spock had been, there was nothing to be able to give him an understanding of that because there was nothing in common between where he was after this life and where we are now. We see that in scripture when we look at Revelation. Because if you think heaven is the materialistic description of Revelation, sorry to disappoint you. That isn't a good enough answer. 
the revelation example that we have of the visual is taking the best of this world and prettying it up as much as we can, trying to convey something that is so beyond our understanding, we can't. There's a reason why our salvation was referred to as a mystery. Because it was pointed at and pointed at and clues were revealed throughout the Old Testament. But until it was drawn together in Jesus, it didn't really make sense. When they would read Isaiah, they would read about the king, the mighty oak. Yes, this is the guy we want. Especially because of Rome. We want a bigger Rome. We want a God Rome. Well, that was half of Isaiah. But then there was the other half of Isaiah's writing. There was the suffering servant. What kind of big and mighty Rome looks like a suffering servant? This doesn't make sense. Was there two different authors where one writes and then another one sneaks in and puts in something different? Well, no. And they knew that. But they couldn't bring the two things together and make it one. It just didn't make sense. They couldn't bring together the idea that Abraham's seed singular was going to be a blessing to the world without them dominating the world. So, part of what Peter is forcing the Jewish part of the church to do is to go back, look at those things, look at them with your current eyes of, okay, I grew up in it, and this is the way we looked at it, but now with the fact that you're allowed to see from the shoulders on down, what is it really? It's a full functioning body. It's a whole lot more than you ever had an understanding for because you were looking for it to be different. Now that it's been revealed, work with the entirety of it and how that carries forward from this point relative to your salvation. Thoughts? Go ahead, Sam. Rich, you're still talking too much. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, so the first thing Peter's doing in Peter is an introduction, an introduction purposely designed to cause the Gentile portion of a congregation to ask. Because you can't get through what we just read about the prophecies and their mystery and not understanding without asking the question, what in the world are you talking about? And then they'd have to take the time to explain. So we look at this and say, okay, well, that sort of makes sense because that makes it a deeper understanding. Well, remember, what are they about to face? Whole lot of persecution. When do you need your faith being built up before you face that whole lot of persecution? Peter's writing is designed to build the faith of those that came from the Jewish background as well as those who came from a heathen background. So that in hearing it, one from Peter, and saying, well, we know Peter is an apostle, so we can believe this even if we can't understand it. And then to hear from their brothers and sisters, oh yeah, this really does have a big whopper size meaning to it. And here's the big whopper that you didn't know about that we didn't really understand. But boy, is Peter putting it right there on the platter in front of us to start chowing down on. So are there any questions or are we cool to move forward with verse 11? 
We're cool? Okay. And I can barely see the clock, so I will make my best effort at not going over time. <clears throat> so starting with verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What did the Jews expect Christ to be? Physical ruler. We've already said that. Is that the thought they should be carrying forward? No. They need to make that adjustment because is a physical ruler coming to their rescue in this time of suffering? No. What is their salvation? Not of this world and not in this world. Because if it was of and in this world, going back to what we covered last week, it is not going to be undefiled. It is not going to be unfading. And I'm forgetting the N word. <laughs> uh, Im, imperishable. If it's this world, and that's the standard we're looking for in our salvation, this world fails on all three of those fronts. He's telling them, gird up your minds. And that's another fun expression. And guys don't think about it because we don't wear dresses. But if you're getting ready to run and you're in a dress, especially if it were a long one, you sure don't want that dangling around your ankles when you're trying to run. You got to hike that puppy up, just like the robes that they were wearing back then. You'd have to scooch that thing up, possibly put a belt between your legs just so you could run. Whatever, get ready. Get your mind ready for what you're about to face. Recognize who is the power, who is the authority, and what you are called to be in Him. Because if you don't, you're going down for the count. And... We're there. Those that did not already have their mind girded up in some respect are gone. And I'm talking COVID. And I'm not talking because they died a physical death. I'm talking spiritual. We are in the time he's talking about in that respect. If we do not gird up our minds relative to the truth we know, being ready for action, and being ready for action doesn't mean saying I'm sitting on the pew. It means looking for the opportunity to do, to make that difference. And I'll be honest, on that one I got slapped in the face at work on it this weekend. And boy, did it knock me out. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and give it to you. Um, it's a hostile environment, and I mean that in an abusive way. And in the past, there was a time when on a weekly basis, my job, as I took it, was to allow my head to be ripped off in front of the entire staff so that I could then take the next day to two to sew my head back on. And one day after the meeting, one of the other staff members said, why are you allowing this to happen? The stuff that you just got ripped up over had nothing to do with your job. You can't do any of that. That's not what you do. You're IT. You don't deal with the records. You don't deal with this. You don't deal with that. Why are you allowing this? Why aren't you speaking up? And I said, well, if I'm not the one, who next? Are you ready to be the one who gets their head ripped off? Because you know that's what's going to happen every week with this person at the head. 
And after a pause, no, I'm not. When you're in that kind of situation, sometimes, myself, you see no way out of it. And I learned how to duck and cover. I taught others how to duck and cover. That didn't take care of the problem. It didn't make the problem better. It didn't make the problem go away. And while what took place on Friday pales in comparison, it just reminded me so badly of what I'd been through that I didn't realize how shell-shocked I was until I got a phone call and Good morning, can I help you? Oh, well, it must be a good morning because it's already afternoon. You must be being really productive. And I looked at the clock on my computer, expecting to see it say 9.30, and it was 12.30. I was that far gone with the stress of something that was probably inconsequential, but it was wrong, and that's where I was at. I prepared wrong, and preparing wrong didn't get me where I really needed to be, and now I'm trying to recover from that mess. They were going to face far worse than verbal abuse and public humiliation. They were going to face physical torture and potentially death. They needed to be prepared with a right mindset for how to approach it and how to overcome it as God put it forth, not as the world put it forth. Because the answer wasn't take out your sword and cut them down. The answer was, stand up for the truth. Give witness to the truth. Jesus didn't mow them all down at Calvary and say, I forgive all of their sins, but you all so are getting boom. And like a nuclear explosion, with him being the epicenter, all of Rome gets wiped out. That's not what happened, because that's not what it's about. We need to be prepared to act. And prepared doesn't mean sitting by and being good and prepared. It means knowing what we need to do in the situation and being the one who steps up and acts as soon as we see it. Yes? And I don't think that's where a lot of times, I know I fall short and I think a lot of people do, in preparing your mind for action. You know, believing that God can handle things is not what we need to do. We need to know that God will handle things if we do what's right. Yeah. And it'll all work out. But you know, just believing that God can is not faith. Knowing that He will is faith. Yeah. And if we do the right thing, God has faith. Yeah. No. And we all fall short of that, I think, it's, uh, in, uh, in the situation. If I do right, I know that God will take care of this. I don't believe you will. I know it will. Yeah, and I'd like to tie that thought back to Robert's post last week. Because if you think about the one talent person, what was their testimony when they went before the king? I know you are one who reaps where you haven't planted. I know you are the go-getter who accomplishes when nobody is expecting anything. I know that I'm not supposed to sit on that talent because you expect a yield. 
I'm not supposed to sit on what I have received, especially when what I've received is the encouragement and the understanding that more is expected of me. Not because I'm the one that's going to do it all, but because God is there ready to accomplish almost with my weakest effort. If I make the effort, if I put out that, well, yeah, I did that sermon, quarter of a talent, God's going to bless that. And the quarter of a talent I'm referring back to, if you remember that sermon, was my dad's preaching ability. My dad had literally a quarter of a talent towards preaching. And maybe that's given him a whole lot of benefit. But when he was called to use that quarter, he got up and he did. And because he did, I'm here now. Because if dad could get up there with that little ability, with that much fear, because my dad was so not an in front of everybody kind of person. If he could do that, I so could do that. With the knowledge and understanding, as Boone has pointed out, of God's ability, God's preparedness to give our whole study in Joshua. What was given? All of the land. What was received? Only the little bit they were willing to go out and get. If all we do is have a few that are acting, what are we going to get? A little bit. Is that God's failing? No. That's our failure to gird up our minds for action. Working with that talent and I don't know if I've said it, I think I have. If your one talent is attendance, use it. And I mean that 100% serious. Because could you imagine the impact of somebody coming into this auditorium for the class? And instead of seeing the few, and I'm happy you're here. But if instead they saw 30 or more, this is a good sized crowd. That would have an impression. If we did Sunday evening services, same kind of thing. I've been in a Sunday evening service of one, two, three, four, where three of those were my family. I still preached the sermon. I led the singing. I was the only male present. I did the prayers. <laughs> How would it have looked to a guest? It would have looked pretty scary. And the first thought probably would have been, wow, this is a dead congregation, moving right along. And okay, in Newbury, we're considering that if they're gonna to try to grow, the answer isn't to try to grow the people by bringing them on a Sunday night and a Wednesday night. It's set up home-based Bible studies on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and get those new in a different environment than the one that's going to make them go, wow, this is so not healthy. We, with the talent even, that we have, can make a huge difference when that one talent is used. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was a hand up, not a hand of thought. Okay. So, Peter, it's a worthwhile book, letter, whatever you want to call it, from the standpoint, we're there. We are in the situation where we're going down because of what we're facing with COVID, with what we're facing from the government. Because in some states, Florida, thank you, is not one of them. Communion was one of the things that they decided, no, this shouldn't be happening. Singing should not be happening. Gathering in a building should not be happening. I'm gonna get the wrong M, Michigan. 
I believe, only opened up for any kind of worship services about a month to two months ago. Prior to that, no, nobody was having any kind of public worship service. State law, you can't do this. And so there was no gathering. We need to think about that one. Think about it from the one talent perspective. How good do you feel when you at least get the email saying, hey, I've been thinking about you? That little bit helps. I'll be honest, I'm an awkward hugger. But given the chance to, I give a hug. Doc, that one time she came back, she'd been out for a week or two. Better believe, I asked her. You said you were in need of a hug. Are you ready for one right now? I'm good if you are. She goes, yeah, I'm good, okay, and she got a hug. How much do you think that hug meant to her at that time? That not only had I read about it and commented about it, I followed through and I did it. That's the kind of thing that's gonna keep somebody coming back. One out of three people who visit a congregation if you ask them, do you want to be in a Bible study? We'll say yes. That's an impressive, terrifying number. One out of three who visit, who have never been to that congregation before, if they're actually in the community and you ask them, would you like to be in a Bible study? will say yes. That's a statistic and from a good friend who is now an elder, that was the reality he found when he started making sure he was one of the people greeting. And he's the person, unlike me, who recognizes all faces and remembers names. I mean, for that, you need my son, Tyler. You don't need me. <laughs> I'm not the person who can do that. Um, wired differently but for somebody like that who recognizes and knows hey haven't seen you for blah 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 blah. oh that's cool and you work where oh that's neat well are you interested in the bible study because we do blah 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 and we can set you up even if it's not on the regular time it could be with so and so at this time or this time one out of three will say yes he found that when he started asking after finding out oh you're visiting cool well, if you're interested in a Bible study, we can get that going. Well, yeah, I am interested. And one out of three people said yes. There are things we need to be doing, being prepared to do. And as Boone has already pointed out, God is so ready to back and produce the right response. And all right, I'm pressing up against my time. It's like a little old lady said on a mountain. We went there because I like to go to out of the way places, no matter how much of a hole in the wall they look like when we're on vacations. The greasier the spoon joint looks like, the more I'm ready to go. Because even if it's a bad restaurant, it makes for a good story later on. <laughs> So we went cruising along in the mountains up there in Tennessee, trying to get a bit out of the way to find this hole in the wall. And we knew we'd know it when we saw it. And finally we see one. It's like, all right, it was a mountain cafe. And so it was about 15 minutes away from where we were staying at the time, back off the beaten path and so forth. So we head on back and we say, okay, we found the place we're having lunch at. Everybody load up. So everybody loaded up and we went over again, this time with my parents and all the kids and so forth. And we're going through and we're reading the menu. Okay, it says right here, mountain burger. What's a mountain burger? She goes, well, it's sort of obvious to anybody who knows anything. This is on a mountain, that's a burger. Mountain burger. She was the owner. She was a waitress. She was a good lady. And not a lot of business, but enough. 
and asked her, you look like you're old enough to retire. Why do you keep doing this? She goes, well, I thought about that a couple times myself. I don't have to be working. I like meeting people. And I figure God's going to bring in my door the people I need or the people who need me. So until otherwise, I'm going to keep the doors open and I'm having fun. I'm blessed by those who come through the door or I'm blessed by being a blessing for them. She got a whopper tip from me that day. The people who come through these doors are an opportunity for us to be a blessing to them or for them to be a blessing to us. Even if sometimes it's stretching us outside of our comfort zone and causing us to grow. First Peter. Oh yeah, there were a lot of people being called to stretch and grow. And they needed it. We're also called to stretch and grow. Because we really need it. Are there any last thoughts? Because like I said, I don't want to run over time. I learned my lesson last week. I burned up my battery. It quit before my sermon quit. <laughs> I now have extra batteries. So sorry, even if I'm long-winded, you're going to get it all. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much.